everyone and welcome to Forward Thinking. It's Christy and Charlie here from CS2. Today we have our guest Bianca Ashalu, who's the VP of Marketing at Propel, as well as the CMO and co-founder of an awesome coffee shop called Nirvana Soul, which is actually just down the street from us in San Jose, California. Uh, we wanted to have Bianca on to chat about something that maybe happens to some demand gen folks here, but really like taking the SDR team under the marketing's wing and managing them. And we'll chat chat through what that experience was like for Bianca, the pros and cons maybe of, you know, SDRs reporting into marketing, as well as get some insight into her career history of how she came up through marketing in different roles and now is a VP at Propel. So welcome, Bianca. Thank you. Just happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So just to kick it off, um, we like to get a little bit of an origin story from our guests. So would love to have you give a quick intro into your career history um, and also, you know, how you got into your leadership role now at Propel. Sure. So if y'all don't mind, I can take us way back, right? So <laughs> my leadership background I think really comes from growing up playing sports. So I was uh, playing competitive basketball since I was like seven years old and then got into volleyball a little later. And doing that, I was always the captain of those teams. I was a point guard. So I think the, the leadership stuff just sort of came natural to me. You know, fast forward a little bit, then I got into student government. I was the student body president of my high school. <laughs> I just did <laughs> all of those things that kind of put me in charge. And I think that just translated into me starting my career. So the first couple of years of my career, because I don't have a marketing background by education. Um, I went to school to be a journalist. I thought that's what I would do was write mm. for this magazine in particular. Um, so when I got into marketing, I just felt like I was playing catch up and I had to learn so much and I leaned on my, the fact that I could write. So I was like, oh, okay, I can do content marketing. Um, and then once I became more confident and comfortable, those natural leadership skills just popped back up and I found myself sort of just leading from where I was. So I didn't need a title. I didn't need those responsibilities in particular. I just like to get things done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes someone just pulling the reins and say, I'll lead us there. So I would do that. So after spending a whole years in digital marketing and marketing ops and sales ops, um, I started gathering around more folks, more marketers at the company. Sometimes they weren't even marketers. Sometimes they were salespeople or customer success. And I would just make teams out of anyone and say, this is what we need to get done. And here's the role that you can play in it. And they would just sort of go with me, <laughs> which was awesome. Um, but having that kind of influence, I think is super cool and super important, but it was just without the authority of the title, it was harder to get approvals, of course, there were some walls I would come up against. Um, and so that's when I knew like I need more authority. And so I started looking for roles where I could be a director. And then just a few months back, I was promoted to VP of marketing at Propel. So do you think you were born with that, the leadership mentality, or was it nurtured in you at a young age by by someone like your sports coach or something like that? Like how, how do you think it develops that early? It's probably a combination of both so, because before basketball, I can't remember just being in charge on the playground or anything like right. that. <laughs> <laughs> happening. I wasn't running things that way. In fact, I have an older sister, so I'm the middle child. So if anything, she was the boss. Um, and so once I got into basketball and, and worked with good coaches and saw that I had an app for it, um, I just wanted more, like I wanted to mm -hmm. win games. And then when it became more about sort of working with teammates to bring out the best in them, then it was like, oh, okay, so winning is important, but I also want to win the right ways. And so that's when I think the leadership thing went to the next level, where it wasn't just about me and, and winning games by myself. Yeah, maybe a bit of competitive spirit in you and you felt like the best way to win was to rally everyone around and Get yeah, on the same I, like that more, I like that more than anything. That's the best part of my job is working with people and helping mm -hmm. them achieve more than they thought they can do. Um, if it's not about that, then I'm just not that interested. Yeah, that's very much a, you're a point guard at heart. Mm -hmm. uh, just be the point. <laughs> yeah. I'm English. I don't get these, <laughs> these analogies. So you might have to explain them to me. <laughs> Being able to, you know, start the plays, call them, you know, be the leader, get the hard shot when you need to. So 
Um, the tempo so, on the court. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. I played some basketball as a kid, so I, I, uh, I like that analogy a lot. Um, so, you know, you're a VP of marketing for Pell, but you also, and I just find this fascinating, fascinating. We both do because we're huge coffee fans. We've actually got coffee from coffee your fans shop. Or coffee addicts. I'm addicts. Not sure which one, but you guys have <laughs> the cyclone drip coffee at Nirvana, which I love. Um, yeah. it's probably like even more strong than normal coffee, which is why we like it. But <laughs> You do run your coffee shop with your sister at Nirvana Soul. And what's your role there? And, you know, how do you balance the two? Um, I know you probably get that question a lot, but would love to um, hear a little bit about that as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I do get that question more and more these days. I think as the business is growing. And in fact, I just got it yesterday from the an internal person at Propel. <laughs> I get, do get it all the time. Um, I think the key there is that one, I have an awesome team at Nirvana Soul. I have an awesome team at Propel and I'm supported on all sides. So my sister's really at Nirvana Soul full time. She's the talent, I say. She's been in coffee forever. Um, and then at Propel, I lead four functional areas. So I have someone who's leading campaigns. I work with an agency for content. Previously had someone uh, writing content in-house. We have an events person. We have an SDR manager. So I don't do it all myself. And I find also that a part of my personality is really striving to be present. So wherever I am, I try to be all there. So I, the example I give is right now, I'm recording this with y'all. So I'm not thinking about anything else. This is the only place I'm at right now. And when it comes to doing Nirvana Soul stuff later today, then I'll be there at Nirvana Soul. So I just sort of balance it that way by making sure I don't overwhelm myself by thinking I have to do everything at one time because it really is a one thing at a time deal. Well, you even said um, when you took a bit of time off recently, you were fully present there, right? You didn't open your laptop, you're fully present, just enjoying your time off. So definitely seems like you're, you're able to completely focus on what's important at that time. Yeah, I mean, I would go crazy, right? I have to be good at compartmentalizing or there's just no way any of this would be possible. And I don't always get it right. Like there are definitely times when things come up that you know surprise me or that I didn't expect. And then I have to sort of juggle multiple things at, at a time, but I'm not good at juggling. My team at Propel will tell you, I'm not great at that. Like when they talk to me, they know it is, we're only doing this one thing right now. <laughs> and when we're done with it, we'll move on to the next thing. And that is just how we best operate. But I think that's important. I think yeah. people can get to stretch themselves too thin and then you're not doing anything well, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're just doing everything average. But if you can focus on a smaller amount of things, then you can do them really, really well. Exactly totally. right. Yeah, Our, a lot of marketing ops folks who listen to this, well, anyone in marketing, like I think you know that the more like fire drills or things that pull you away from being present, the more you're spending time and trying to balance this all, it just creates this chaos that just puts you into like, you know, a paralyzed state. So um, oh, yeah. I, I'm a huge, like a huge proponent of, you know, focusing on your priorities and and really like being present. So I love that advice. Yeah, so controversial multitasking is a myth. I am that person who says that. And my sister <laughs> argues with me all the time because she's like, <laughs> I'm making three drinks and I'm doing the schedule <laughs> and I'm talking to customers and I'm cleaning tables. And I'm like, yeah, but you're still doing all of that at one time, one thing at a time, but she does not see it that way. So <laughs> I get the controversy. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. So one of the, uh, the reasons why we wanted to have you on today is really to discuss um, a, a change that you went through, but I mean, I think I've even gone through this in-house where I started to build out a SDR team, mainly because I worked in demand gen and I said, we needed one. And they were like, okay, well you go build one, <laughs> but, um, but, right. but you had a change at Propel where the SDR team then went under your management. And so could you talk a bit about what that experience was like and had you had any experience leading sales development teams before that? And how was that different compared to what you were tasked with at Propel? Yeah. So the last time I led sales development was probably over five or six years ago uh, when I was in retail tech. 
And it started with just one SDR and then it expanded as we were doing ABM to lead three of them, but they were all in South Africa, which was remote. So it probably helped prepare me for this, which I mean, how could you ever expect that to happen? Um, but that company was just a little further along in terms of the structure, the playbook, what the expectations were around sales development teams. At Propel, we had just expanded the sales development team right before the pandemic sent us all home. So we brought in a bunch of folks. We had a sales kickoff. We were all excited for the year ahead. I'm sure this sounds familiar to many people <laughs> listening because it was around sales kickoff time. Um, and then immediately they got sent home. And a lot of them, this was their first job. So, you know, there is something to be mm-hmm. said for having SDRs all in the same place to learn together, to grow together. That, that already just threw everything into um, a spin. But I wasn't leading the team at that time. I was still just with demand gen. And it wasn't until after I was promoted to VP of marketing that the SDR team was moved under marketing. The only thing I asked of the CEO and the CMO when they they offered me the role was that I'd have full autonomy to do what needed to be done with that team. Um, I just looking at the numbers, we knew that we weren't as successful as we could be. There was definitely some bottlenecks and breakdowns, and that was just us reporting top of funnel stuff for demand. Um, So we had an idea of what might be broken. We wanted to be able to fix it. When they came on, immediately the previous manager uh, put in her notice. And so (laughs) that meant that it wasn't just me managing a manager, it became me managing SDRs directly, Um, which again is a throwback to how it was a long time ago for me, but I haven't done it in years. So I Mm -hmm. I wasn't the best person to do that job. As we know, managing the SDR team is a lot about hiring. So I immediately went into hiring cycles, looking for an SDR manager, but also looking for new SDRs just so we had full coverage. Um, Any management changes that happen at a company will lead to turnover. And and that's what we started facing. So as we were trying to fix up the structure and get a new manager in and look at new metrics, there was just a lot of things happening at once um, that kind of even threw me off from my wanting to be present in, in one thing at a time because I still had the rest of my demand team to manage. Um, so it, it has been challenging, but I think I'm a weirdo in that it's an adventure for me, right? Like I'm excited by this stuff, even though it's a lot, I see the vision. I know what this team was capable of and just owning the full top of funnel, even to middle of funnel with this team too, is like a demand person's dream. So why would the SDRs report into marketing? Part of it is because we're control freaks and we want to control the whole thing as much as possible. <laughs> but part of it is too that, we're operational focused. Every one of my team is an ops person. That was the first hire I made when I started at Propel was I wanted to have a marketing ops person because that's my background. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we just sort of can see the path through from chaos. And that's where the SDR team should live. Whoever can manage them best operationally, I agree is the team that should manage the SDRs. Uh, one of our questions um, coming up is around the challenges you uncovered. And you mentioned a few there already, but one, one of them being obviously just owning the team and then the pandemic hits, right? And like you, that obviously must have been a pretty crazy time there, right? And then also like, did you, well, first, first off, did what was that like? And then also, what did you, did you like introduce any tools or yeah. any anything to like help bring that alignment between SDRs because like you mentioned as well having them all in the same place like learning from each other like sharing ideas and stuff must is really useful right but then now they're all remote they're in their bedroom they're not speaking to each other they're just communicating over Slack like how did you handle that and was there anything that you had to pivot on or introduce to help manage that for the last year? Yeah what you described is exactly right So once I took over the team, I don't think I even realized how siloed they were from each other. So there was just knowledge sharing that wasn't happening. You'd have SDRs that are more experienced who are in their own world over there. And then you'd have, you know, younger, newer, fresh graduate SDRs who don't even know where to begin to to get help, right? Because they... Mm -hmm 
just are sitting by, it's their first time doing it. Um, and so there wasn't anything besides a daily 15 minute huddle, I think that was happening at that time. But that was really just to keep them, you know, in sync, see each other's faces virtually, of course. Um, it wasn't really getting into how are we progressing towards our goals as a team. And I think that happened to more than just SDRs last year. I think there was just a need to say, we're all in this together. Let's take a breather here. Obviously, we're not going to have the most productive year ever. Let's just be together and, and chat. And that's what was happening in those meetings. So when I came in as a man person who is really into metrics and numbers, I was a little surprised by that. I was like, oh, like, I get we got to catch up and hang out, but we also are here to do a job. So let's start <laughs> looking at the dashboards. Let's look, pull up where we are. What are your, where are your activities at? And I think they're like, oh, this is just not how we previously run this team. And the new SEOs are like, oh, is this what we're supposed to be doing? So I, I really just introduced more accountability, I think. And that worked for some folks and it doesn't work for others. Um, but working together towards a goal, I think is something that really helps people feel camaraderie. I mean, from my background and experience, just commiserating is not enough. We need to mm -hmm. say like, we're here to get these meetings booked or we are here to generate this pipeline or, or whatever the case may be, but everyone working towards something that's bigger than themselves is I think the best way to pull people out of a slump. So that's what I was really introducing. So I brought in a couple more meetings where we would view review MQLs at the end of each week. And then in the alternating re weeks, we would review the target account list accounts. And it wasn't so much to say like, you know, where are you at with this? It was just to get the team talking and understanding that they're responsible for moving things along. And so that's really, I think, what I introduced that might've been the most valuable in my time of managing them directly because it was a hard gig and it's not something that I think I'm even that great at. So getting a new manager here was, my priority for sure. Yeah. Awesome. I think, but I, I think to your point, it's not even the fact that you maybe aren't even the, you know, can't do the job, but it is like a full-time job, you know, mm -hmm. like being able to train people, having that many draft reports, doing one-on-ones, like you said, this is an entry-level job and, you know, those people need someone there to help guide them. And, and even more so during a pandemic where you said like a lot of where SDRs learn is like in that bullpen kind of, you know, area, like you're listening to other people on the call mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, that's how I should be doing it. You know? So right. trying to replicate that, like, were you using any tools for, you know, sharing, you know, calls like gong or outreach or anything like that, um, that the team can learn from? Yeah, we have Gong, we have Sales Loft. And so in those Friday alternating meetings, what we would do is we ask the team to bring three to five calls they want to share from the target account list, right? So they would either bring those calls with them using Gong, or they would just speak to them, pull up Salesforce, and sort of walk through the history of how they work that account. So it's the closest we could get to doing sort of a bullpen. It's not the same. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how SDR teams are doing it right now. It's tough. Um, but it was pretty close because it was the first time a lot of those SDRs had sort of listened to someone walk through the process of prospecting, talking to someone, asking certain questions, you know, doing that discovery. They just hadn't heard it because they are in their rooms or living with mm -hmm. multiple roommates or with their parents. Like it just is a different thing. Um, so that was the best way that we could find to do it. And now with the, the new manager, I think he's able to coach them more directly. So he's spending much more time. I was an hour with each SDR like every other week. That's just not enough. So you're right. Like they need that more like hands-on training and guidance. So now that they all roll up into marketing and you've had that for a while, I know obviously the pandemics of like we've just been talking about has kind of thrown a spanner in the works and kind of made things a bit more difficult, but like, what are the benefits that you've seen um, since you've implemented that change? You know, it hasn't been too long to see super benefits from it, but what I will say is that they are a step in our campaigns, right? So there's more alignment now. So every month we're meeting with them and doing sort of our demand gen monthly, where we're talking about what are the campaigns coming up and what role do they play in it? 
And so there's just tight, tighter alignment with the team. Also in those alternating meetings on Friday, we come in and we say, these are campaigns that are coming up next week. Here's what our expectations are from you. Um, that visibility, I think they just didn't see and they didn't understand even what role they were supposed to play. So when marketing before was just sending things over to the fence to them, they were like, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do with this. But now I think they understand like this is a connected journey and they're part of that journey. So when marketing is doing certain things, that enables me to play off of that and use it in my conversations to help further along this particular prospect. And so there's sort of been a philosophical change that's happening or a mental change in their, in their minds where they can see where they fit in this buying cycle. Um, so I think that is probably the, the bit biggest or most visible benefit I've mm -hmm. seen so far, but I expect in the future as we start really leaning into AVM, we'll see more of that. Well, that must just be a much better customer experience, right? Like if, okay. if they're getting the same, getting a message from marketing or they're engaging with something and then they're getting a similar message from the SDR, like that is related to whatever they engage with from marketing, must be a much better customer experience, like once you have that alignment. Yeah, I think so. And, and the benefits for our team too, right? Because we clearly had some blind spots. We weren't able to really enable that team the re way we wanted to because we didn't manage them. So as much as we want to provide them with information, we had no real sway in ensuring that things were being executed on. And we worked closely with their previous manager and with the sales ops person who was really involved too. But at the end of the day, it was like, toss to them and hope for the best. <laughs> we just didn't know for sure that things were being done on their end. Now we can kind of guarantee it and we can hold them accountable. And again, like you said, connect that journey for the customer so it doesn't feel disconnected at all. Totally. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I'm more interested too, because you, it's, you know, you have an operations role, you have an operational minded team, it sounds like. So did that also give you a chance to put in kind of more structure or have a better training on what the process should look like? Because I think process is super important for SDRs outside of just like, you know, how they should uh, be on the phones, but really like where, where they're focused and how they're being productive is a huge part of the job. Did you have to do a lot of retraining for that? Did you put any changes in place? We did. So that is probably the biggest thing that we did was that we looked at what they were being measured on, which at the time was qualified pipeline, right? So they were supposed to set up SQLs for the AEs. Now, the enablement and training that they've gotten and sort of just how fragmented it's been in a pandemic world, I don't think it was preparing them enough to really do that kind of work, that level of detail with a prospect to get them to be really sales qualified. So we pulled back and we said, okay, what is a more attainable and inspirational goal for them? And looking at the two options between SQL, our meetings, we went the meetings route. And so this was proposed to us by someone earlier, but we just hadn't done the research into it. Like I said, the marketing wasn't lead the team, so we didn't really think about it. But once we became on, we're like, okay, let's really think about if meetings is the best hit for this team. Turns out it was. It gives our AEs more at-bats. The AEs are more experienced and knowledgeable about our solutions so that they can take things over the line to create that qualified pipeline and opportunities. Um, so the way that we did that, though, is through what we call all bound, which is probably familiar to y'all, but it's an inbound and outbound process where we're working leads and contacts. So the leads come in. We had a process already on the inbound side that our marketing ops person designed, gosh, almost a year and a half, two years ago, which includes like a 21 day follow up process. So a lot of that stuff stayed the same. But what became different is that instead of them continuing to work this to SQL, they would create sort of a sales appointment task is what we call it, our meeting task. And in that task, there's a place for the AE to actually get feedback. So it creates this loop where they can grade the meeting. So A, B, and C based on different criteria as if, if the um, if the meeting fulfills our, pain, our person, right person, right pain, the right profile. So if it's all those things, then it's an A, right? And if two of three or one of three goes down to B or C. There's also a place where they can put in actual feedback, like type in feedback. So that loop would help us strengthen the SDR as a sales development rep, but also help them send over better qualified meetings. 
Um, and then we look at all those at the end of each month and see sort of where we averaged on the grades, look at the qualitative feedback um, from the AE, and then just do better in the next month. So it's, it's a huge process, <laughs> of course, <laughs> but the way that we broke it down step by step with the SDRs, they get it. So we obviously still have some work to do on the AE side to make sure that they're putting in the feedback. But at the end of the day, our process is pretty locked tight. Like we know exactly what we're supposed to do when leads come in, when a contact comes in, if it's on a target account already, the SDR just has a plan. And, and I don't think that they had that kind of clarity before. Yeah, I love Sorry, that. That was long-winded and very detailed. My bad, y'all. No, detail no, is good. Deep, like I feel yeah. like we, we really like to go bounce between like, high level strategy and then getting into the weeds because we have kind of like a range of people listening and i think a lot of times people's feedback for podcasts and content in general is that it's not detailed enough or, and like actionable but the way you laid that out there someone could actually just go and take that and be like okay i want to implement this process you know so, so that's super valuable advice so don't don't feel like you have to keep it surface level like go deep for sure okay cool i have no problem sharing all of this like we're learning as we go but this has worked for us and yeah if it's something someone wants to take totally steal it all <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the advice and and the one of the interesting things that you said there was, you know, we're still working on the AEs and their feedback. Cause right when you're saying that, I was like, oh, I wonder if they're having any issues with the AEs but any <laughs> feedback. <laughs> but I think um having that though, the feedback loop and then, you know, is better than nothing. And I think having clear directions for the AEs have is, you know at least something that can strengthen that alignment too. Like this is the reason why we're gathering this information so we can just get you better meetings. Like that's an incentive enough, right? So it's very clear, like we're asking you to do this thing and it's for this. And it's very much in the mindset of like, you'll benefit out of it, which, you know, for an account executive, they're, you know, they value their time as they should, uh, you know, and so you have to make it maybe about them that they're going to benefit. So exactly, exactly right. And, and change management management is always tough, right? So they're used yeah. to getting SQLs that in their minds, they can immediately make to pipeline. But we were seeing mm -hmm. that some of those were getting stuck too, because there was no clear direction for the SDRs. So they were sort of using their own judgment. And a lot of times it just wasn't where it needed to be. So now, mm -hmm. Let's make the AEs a little bit more responsible for generating pipeline, right? Like, don't put that only on this, like, young SDR who's just learning this industry to say, oh, yes, this person is ready to buy. Okay, let's get some agreement on that before we just drop them into our pipeline and then they go nowhere, right? So, you're right. It's, it's beneficial, I think, on all sides, but always getting salespeople to do things for marketing is, is, is a little tough. Totally. Just on the last thing, so it sounds like you've hired a, a new SDR manager. What has been that shift? Are you still very much involved in, in, you know, meeting now with the manager weekly and training them up on the process that you've built today? Like how, how has that handoff been? And do you think actually doing a lot of that role before they've come on made it a, make you a better manager for that person? 100% has, um, because I know the background, I know the challenges, and I also know the people. So mm -hmm. previously, I may not have gotten to know the people as well as I did having to manage them directly. Um, so I've kept the one-on-ones every other week with the SDRs for just half an hour, just to just to catch up and see how things are going, which is nice. And I, and I gave them the option. I was like, obviously, you don't have to meet with me ever again. <laughs> If you don't want to <laughs> but they they all were like no let's keep these meetings it's just good to to stay in sync now most of my time now is spent with the sdr manager right and so i'll talk to him a few times a day whether it's just a slack call we also have a formal one-on-one -on -one that we're doing on a weekly basis but he's the expert so i want anyone who works for me any of the functional leaders i manage to have ownership over their areas and, and they do. And so I definitely want him to be empowered to see what I've done so far, which is quite a bit in a short amount of time. Like I said, I define that, that process. We have changed the structure. We've done some leveling things for the SDRs. I started documentation just to get onboarding and enablement more defined. And so he's picking that up and running with it but also able to bring in his expertise as someone who's previously led sales development, led AEs, been an AE himself. Um, and so he takes it over the line, which is awesome. 
So handoff yeah. has actually been pretty good. Still busy, but it's been good. That's good. That's great. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think one of the, it kind of leads into my next point, but one of the things I think is fascinating for you, and I think has maybe, you know, been the, you know, attribute to why you maybe are running, you know, a VP of marketing for Powell, but you've had a very, very career. So you've had operational roles, you've done digital marketing, demand gen, you know, you did, you had, took on this role of, you know, really managing an SDR team. You know, there's not very many areas left on the marketing side that you haven't been like an, you know, individual contributor for or really leading. So do you feel like, you know, having that broad skill set has really helped you in getting your leadership position now and you know has it made it easier for you you know you don't have to do a lot of uh, education for yourself um, with owning all of those uh, departments 100 percent, right because I fell into marketing so I always feel like I'm playing catch up I just started teaching myself as much as I could I learned technology I read a lot um, and that was the way that I sort of became a jack of all trades because I didn't know what I didn't know. So I was like, I'm just going to learn it all. Then. <laughs> um, and by doing that, I think it's made me a more empathetic leader because mm -hmm. I know what goes on behind the scenes. Like, so when, the, and you all know, because you talk about marketing ops all the time, people will ask you for something and think it's like a click of a button. <laughs> but really, it's never just a click of a button and nothing ever works the way that it should. And so there's just like a hundred little things that people don't see that marketing ops people do. But I see those things. So when I go and talk to someone I lead in marketing ops and, and ask them for something, we'll joke around and say, yeah, it's just copy paste. But we know what it really is behind the scenes. I, I'm empathetic there. Um, I've led events, so I know what it takes to put on events. I know the million things that go wrong at events that leaders most never hear about. Um, I did digital marketing. I led demand generation. I've done ad copy. I write. So, you know, there's not a lot that you can even get over on me. So if you try to tell me something's not possible, I'm like, look, I know it's possible <laughs> because I have done it all. Um, so, yeah, I... I think that becoming a VP of all of these different areas just makes sense. I like being a jack of all trades. I like working with jacks of all trades, but I also understand that in marketing, you have to be good at something, great at something. Um, and for me, I think that has become leadership. People management is something I think I just have a natural ability for. But also, like I said, I am a writer too. So if all else goes wrong, I can always write. <laughs> <laughs> Just write a memoir about like your how you got to where you are today and being a Jill of all trades. Um, and yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, I mean, we could talk chat about this could be leading up to your book, but what is some advice you'd give to any marketing ops or demand gen folks who are looking to position themselves in maybe different roles or, you know, maybe put, like get themselves into some position. It, one of the things that points out to me, and I love this because I feel like we share it, like all three of us, but you would latch on to like different departments or people to get things done. And you wouldn't just like be so siloed for yourself. And I think that companies, especially startups really, uh, take note of that and, and, and offer it, you know, like there's always way more jobs to be done than there's people there. So you can do that, but what's your advice for people who are trying to do that and pave the way for a leadership position? Like what things do you think that you did specifically along the way that helped make this happen? Yeah, so I think it's kind of what y'all were saying earlier, right? You have to have the ability to look down and in, but also up and out. And I think for a lot of demand people, and I'm maybe picking on us because I am one of us, um, is that we're always looking down and in. <laughs> we can see right in, in front of us very well. And we will get into the nitty gritty of those details and know the thousand steps it's gonna take to get something done. And we're fine living in that little world with us and our computer. So what leadership requires is that you actually look up and out. <laughs> And that transition between the two is a very tough thing to do because you start talking to other leaders who are wanting to know, like, what are we achieving here or where are we going? And that answer is not always easy for someone who's just been so siloed. They're like, well, I'm, I'm putting this webinar together. What do you mean? Like, okay, but why? Like, what is, what is the purpose of this webinar? Where do you see it contributing? Um, so that's really tough. 
Now, what I've done a lot of in my career and what I always suggest to people is that when I saw a role that I wanted, I would go look at job descriptions on LinkedIn and see what that job description was asking for. So it's like back in the day when ABM was all buzzwordy, it would show up in job descriptions. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know much about ABM, so I better learn. So I'd start doing you know, my research. Then I'd be like, how can I make this work in the company I'm at right now? You know, I've always worked at startups. I've always worked at small companies. You can wear multiple hats and pretty much do whatever you want if, if you have that drive to do it. So I started a cross-functional team. I pulled from the CS team. I pulled from the sales team. I was leading the SDRs at that time. And I was like, we're going to do ABM now. And they're like, oh, okay. I don't know what that is, but I trust you. So I want to jump on this ride with you. And then I just started mapping it out from the research I found online. So you could always teach yourself. There's nothing that stops you from learning something or putting it into action once you're within a company. And I think that's important to know. Take action where you are. There's nothing stopping you. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I just try my best to work with as many different types of people as possible. I'm constantly learning. I can't help myself. I'm a crazy person. I need to be doing something. Um, and so I think that's helped. And I would just encourage people to know that there's not a lot of dead ends when you're trying to get to the next level, but it's going to be on you. Like you have to advocate for yourself. That's such a, such a good point. And it's especially true. You said for demand gen people, but even even just for like the core ops people, marketing ops people, even more so true to them because they oh, are yeah. just like so in the weeds all day, struggle to like lift their head above water to be able to see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But we advocate for this all the time because to get that level up and to maybe get to a senior position in ops, even if you just want to stay in ops, right? Marketing ops, and you don't want to become a VP of marketing or a CMO one day, but you want to lead an ops team, you know, like... You, you need to think about the strategy. You need to be that person that's going around, bringing, uh, aligning teams, bringing, bringing like big initiatives around the team. Like other examples are like taking control of like data and reporting and analytics as an ops person, right? Like, cause that's going to be, every, everyone is going to be leveraging that and you're going to be getting a lot more influence and communication and like different um abilities to work with other people across the team and at higher levels and that's going to position yourself better for leadership so I love the way you said it though like stop looking um like inward but like start looking up and out right it's that's really really good way of phrasing it I like that a lot yeah I 100% yeah, agree with you <laughs> it, it's not easy though and I remember when I was in ops um and I was in marketing ops for a while and then an opportunity arose to become a sales ops person too. And I was like, oh, that's probably a lot, but I, I know Salesforce, so I guess I could do it. I raised my hand to do it. And that alone gave me more access to our CFO who I hadn't really talked to before. Um, I was now in these leadership meetings because the data required was coming from now my world. Um, and then you just see how they move. And you're like, oh, okay, now I'm learning just sort of by osmosis, by viewing them, by having that visibility. Here's the kinds of questions they're asking. Here's the information they're looking for. Like all the metrics that I used to look at before, I see, okay, you don't really care about that. It's important to some folks, but it's not important to all folks. And so you just have to get that visibility and be, surround yourself with people who are in levels higher than yours or in roles that you aspire to. Yeah, and I love, I love also what you're saying because... Um, I think we see this with ops people as well a lot where they're kind of like, it's a chicken and egg thing. They're like, oh, well, maybe I could get into leadership. Like, but the only way to get there is I need someone to work for me. So then I can give them the work, the busy work. So then I can become a leader. You know, it's like, well, no, like businesses don't work like that. You have to like earn it. You have to prove yourself first. Like whether, whether that's a good thing or not, whether you like that or not, like you have, that's just the way life works, right? You're going to have to prove yourself first act like a leader then maybe you'll get someone to be working for you to then raise you out of that busy work into more of a leadership position like and that's exactly kind of like what you've done you you just went around you just made it happen right you weren't waiting for someone to give it to you no you can't and it's so funny you say that about you know handing over the busy work some people hire people because they're like oh I just have too much work to do I need to split it in half that is the worst play, play, way to hire people in my mind like the work is never going to stop. Like I think about my day yesterday, I presented our demand gen overview to the QBR. And then I had a recruiting planning meeting with HR. I talked ROI, ROI data with our CMO and I ended my day copy editing. So it's like, <laughs> you know, the work is always going to be there. You should be aware.
aware of that, but you have to start defining like what work is really valuable to do and being able to make those tough cuts and to prioritize and to align yourself with the larger vision of the company, that will become a much bigger part of your job once you're a VP. So finding out how to split the work to focus on the work that really matters. Totally. I love all of that advice. And, um, you know, your time is valuable. And, and, and I think for anyone listening, who's like, oh, well, you know, I'm really early on in my career. It's like, I think it's never too early to start showing like leadership skills or seven years old by the sounds of it, right? You can start (laughs) really. (laughs) <laughs> you can see from where you are. I always tell people that they're like, oh, I just want to be this title. I just want to be a manager. And I'm like, well, how are you showing leadership where you're at right now? Like, cause you can, and, and people can see that too. Oh, this person is like a rock star. This person's a yeah. superstar. Like I can see that they're going to have potential later on. Cause they're already doing stuff where they're at today. Like you can do things. Totally. And for everyone, I, I think I heard this recently uh, or this week, it was like, if you have If you're like sensing fear of something ahead of you, it doesn't mean you have the wrong thing in front of you. It means you have the right thing in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so I think for um, a lot of people who maybe are a bit like nervous to, to take on these skills or changes, you know, pushing yourself or having a little bit of that fear is not a bad thing. Like you should embrace that and and figure out ways that work for you. And if you're always Mm -hmm. just focusing on how to, you know, present your value, I think it'll go a long way. So I love all of this advice. Um, and we, we are out of time, but I want to say thank you so much, Bianca, for joining us. I think this was super valuable for anyone in B2B right now on the demand gen or marketing outside um, all across the board. Um, so for all of you listeners who want to uh, learn a little bit more about Bianca, we'll be linking her LinkedIn profile on, um, on the page for this podcast, and you can go and follow her there um anything else you know if you're in san jose stop by nirvana soul right for a coffee exactly right we are downtown san jose so please come by and visit us and we would love to see you and this has been fun chatting with y'all too i feel like i could have done this for way longer (laughs) thank you for having me on here of course yeah we'll be stopping by too with ava for coffee she also just says coffee coffee all the time so she knows how (laughs) she just sees us drinking all the time she has a little tea set so um but yeah thank you so much everyone for joining today's episode of forward thinking if you like this podcast share it with your friends and colleagues and we'll see you next time have a great one Bye.